The Osterville Village Library is pleased to introduce local author Kathy Aspton. Now, Kathy is a novelist, a screenwriter, lifelong resident of Cape Cod, a public speaker, who no doubt could do this far better than I, uh, occasional host for the television show Books and the World, in addition, a reviewer for litlovers.com and a contributing writer for Her Circle News. Uh, her first novel, I love the title, Baklava, Biscotti, and an Irishman, a finalist for the Multicultural Fiction category of the International Book Awards. So she, she has an impressive resume and no doubt will, will delight with what she has to share today. The sequel to Baklava Biscotti, An Irishman's Son, was published in May 2020. So we invite you, please sit back, enjoy. Kathy will tell you more about the novel and everything she does. And thank you for coming. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. And actually, you have a wonderful speaking voice. Oh, great. <laughs> Hi, um, so happy to be here. I'm really excited about um, being able to present my latest um, novel to an Irishman's son. When I finished the first novel, Baklava, The Scotty and an Irishman, I thought it was a one and done. And, and it was a beautiful story about love and loss and redemption, and it takes place in various parts of the world, and it tied itself together in a way that I didn't understand was going to happen. Um, Baklava Biscotti and an Irishman actually reinforced my belief in fate and things happening for a reason. It reinforced my belief that, um, that the one million things that you do in your life that lead up to this moment all have significance. And uh, I started out, I don't know what I started out writing. I started out writing what was a story about a woman from Neomaka, Greece who marries a uh, Navy medic at the tail end of the Vietnam War. And quickly, they end up in uh, Quincy, Massachusetts, and they begin their life. He's 20 years older than her. In all, for all intents and purposes, they are not compatible in any way. And yet, um, and they love each other. And so the premise is that we actually don't marry people who are compatible to us that quite often the soul knows what it wants and that we marry people or we end up with people that we either have a previous connection with, I'm kind of a big fan of the idea we existed well before this human experience, um, but we have a previous connection with or that we are drawn to in a way that completes us that we don't understand. So picture a couple that uh, he's, again, he is almost 40, he has never been married. He doesn't plan on being married. His idea is I'm getting out of the service and it's gonna be smooth sailing for here. I'm gonna have my pension, life is gonna be easy. And then at the very last minute, while he's um, working as a medic at uh, the Neomakri communication station that the United States is building, um, he ends up meeting her and he meets her, up. I mean, I'll give you a couple of little hints, but he literally hits her with his car. It's one of those, I wouldn't call it a cute meat, I'd call it more like a bloody meat, okay? And he ends up, um, it's an immediate. It's the kind of immediate where um, you don't see it coming and you don't even want it to come. And yet, there it is. Let me think, I'm gonna read just the, he hadn't hit her hard. The steel bumper of the Kamangia had barely grazed the bicycle, making her foot slip from the pedal and wedge itself between the spokes of the bike's front tire. The momentum of her trapped foot caused her body to catapult over the handlebars and slap viciously to the ground. The entire event took a matter of seconds. In just a few seconds more, Danny had vaulted from the offending vehicle and was assessing the young woman's injuries. She was unconscious, that much was certain. Her forehead was split open deep into the hairline of her raven black hair. She probably had a concussion, maybe even a broken neck. Her foot was bloodied and most likely fractured. Think, think stupid, what do you do next? For reasons he couldn't fathom, Danny was paralyzed. It wasn't the slow motion version of a disastrous dream, but something close. He was floating through it, not in a detached way, more like an intensely attached way. 
He was part of the blood coming from her head. He was thrown from the bike with her. Danny was confused. Was it possible he too had hit his head when he swerved the car? She moaned, damn, damn, damn. With her thick accent, Danny thought she was saying his name. How does she know my name? Later, when it was too late for him to not be in love with her, he would realize damn was her favorite curse word. She opened her eyes and brought her hand up to touch her bloodied scalp. She looked right at Danny and said, I was blinded by my tears. It was like that. It was that rapid, that breathtaking, that devastating, and it was too late. His soul had recognized hers and there was no turning back. Two months later, they faked a pregnancy, endured her father's wrath, and were married in the Greek Orthodox Church of St. Nicholas. Six days after the wedding, they headed home to Quincy, Massachusetts and their new life. So when you see that this couple has thrown themselves together in every way possible, and you realize that it's beyond their control and that they're trying to figure out how to navigate through a marriage, um, it is, uh, it's every marriage. It's not, their marriage. Like I, I find that one of the things that happened when I wrote this book is I would hear uh, people's stories, not just about their own incredible beginnings to their relationships with their spouses, but also to the reasons that they stayed together regardless of how unsuited they were for each other. Um, and and I, I believe that, especially for extreme opposites. Um, so. You'll, you'll know that I probably have a little background in psychology <laughs> because I think everything comes down to that. But when two people are kind of middle of the road, those extremes aren't very bad. You know, they kind of sort of feel the same way and they're attracted and they have their... When somebody's personality is here and the other personality is here, uh, they become more of who they are in order to compensate for becoming more of who they are. So it becomes, as, as time goes on, you become more and more extreme with each other. Um, her, her loyalty to her husband is incredible. And she spends her life protecting his health, protecting um, him at, in between bouts of her really, really dramatic, uh, intense feelings she's somebody who feels everything so deeply and he just is trying to figure her out left and right that's all he's trying to do he is picture a really nice guy who's every husband that's ever looked at his wife and thought i don't know what's going on here well there's a lot of times that danny does not know what's going on so in this story it's 1992 we break into their life 20 years into their marriage after the brief discussion of how they ended up together and there's something going on and it takes a while to figure out what exactly is going on. Um, and there's, a, it's a love triangle. There's a third person involved. Uh, I, when I wrote this and I finished act two, the second part, and I knew that it was, I mean, I don't want to say I knew that it was beautiful. I knew that it was such a lovely story and I, you know, got myself a glass of wine, curled up in a ball and cried because it was over. And then three weeks later, I wrote the third part. I realized it wasn't finished. And the third part is this very, um, it's not small, but it's a very important section that is written from the perspective of their son 22 years later. And so, okay, so I think this book is amazing and I've written it and I, and then, and then it it, uh, it ends up, you know, placing in the International Book Awards for the Multicultural Fiction category, and I'm riding on the moon, and and then every book event I go to, somebody's asking me about this section of time. What happened during this section of time that's missing from the book? And I would say, well, I know what happened because I know these characters. I know that this is how they resolved that problem, and this is how they. This is how they mended their hearts. And, and I'd already started writing um, what's now gonna be book three, um, but I'd already started writing that book. It was the story from their son's perspective completely, like at him as an adult and what his journey is. And instead, everyone kept bringing me back to the same spot. And suddenly I thought, wow, that's the story. And I put aside book number three and I began writing An Irishman's Son. And An Irishman's Son is a um, 
nine, six maybe, six or seven probably, month segment of their life together, of, of, of the aftermath of this amazing incident that happens in 1992. This is how they become a couple again. This is the crazy, funny, sad, intimate story of this couple and how they get through this tragedy that they have created. And um, actually, I'll just, I'm going to try to decide what part I'm going to read of this. Sometimes I, all right, I'll just read the back. And the only problem I have, so this book is a complete book. It's a book that if you were to pick it up, you wouldn't know that there was a story. You wouldn't know that there was Baklava Biscotti and an Irishman first. You would think this is a beautiful story. Um, Daniel Maldor wants his, his wife back. He doesn't care that she's pregnant by another man. He refuses to turn his back on the life they built and the love they shared. For 19 years, the Maldors had an enviable, enviable I can write it, I just can't say it, unshakable marriage. How then did Teresa become pregnant by Gregory Costa, a man whose violent death opens the scene to one of the most poignant love stories ever told? Will nine months be enough time for Danny to go from a man betrayed to the proud father of somebody else's baby? Can Teresa forgive herself the worst mistake of her life, never imagining the baby she carries might bring them more happiness than they've ever known if only she can survive the guilt? In an age when one molecule of DNA can change everything you thought true about your life, wouldn't you want to know the love story behind the lie? An Irishman's Son is the continuation of Teresa Giannopoulos and Danny Muldoor's enduring love story, first introduced in the novel Baklava Biscotti and an Irishman, a finalist in the Multicultural Fiction category for International Book Awards. When I first wrote this, I had just begun, um, I'd taken a class from Casey Sherman and I don't know if you, Casey Sherman is an amazing Cape Cod writer who's, um, who has, his, his books have been turned into um, movies. He um, wrote The Finest Hours. He wrote Patriot Game. He, he wrote uh, the, the book, um, the, the, I want to say The Bucket Challenge, but there's a, a better name for it. Anyway, The Pete Brady Story. And, and he's written so much and he's very, very uh, well um, credentialed. And, when I took this class, he said to me, he'll probably someday watch this and think, yeah, I did say that, didn't I? He said, um, one of the things that you have to do is be a determined writer. He said, when you write something and you know it's good, he said, you stand there and you wave it in the air and you say, what important person wants to read this and write a blurb for the front of my cover? So he didn't realize I was halfway through this book when I took the class and then I finished the book and I said, hey, and he said, don't take no for an answer. So I sent him an email that said, I would love it if you would review my novel. And I would love it if you would write a book blurb for it. And so he ignored me. And then I wrote, I would really love it. And you did say, like, be persistent. So this is me being persistent. And he was like, okay, absolutely. So I sent it to him and he, wrote, he read it. And he sent me back just the loveliest email. And the email was, that the characters stayed with him, that they stayed with him long after the story was over. And then he wrote, let's see. In her novel, An Irishman's Son, author Kathy Aspen shows us the ripple effects of one decision and its lasting impact on many lives. Her prose is crisp, her characters speak to you, and the journey she takes you on will stay with you long after you've finished reading. An Irishman's Son is a penetrating and well-crafted tale. Casey Sherman, New York Times bestselling author of The Finest Hours. And then Anne LeClaire did a lovely review for me. And, um, and then the producer of Books in the World, Madeline Holt, did a lovely review for me. And so here I was with this book and a pandemic. And so <laughs> I was like, how do you launch a book in a pandemic? Like, how does that all happen? And luckily, I had such a nice readership for Baklava, body, uh, Biscotti, and an Irishman that I just sort of tapped into that. Um, and, and I've gotten such tremendous, tremendous feedback about it. Um, and in the, along the way, I've, uh, you know, definitely I've been busy during this pandemic. It's just, and I hate to say, a pandemic might in fact be a writer's dream, but to not have the places that you have to go to not have the things you have to do and to be in a position where 
there's your computer, there's your idea. So during this time, I wrote a screenplay um, called The Magnificent Quarantinos. It's actually a family, I don't want to call it a dramedy, but it's a dramedy because it takes place during a pandemic. And it's about one family getting through the pandemic. Um, and I say that it's Chevy Chase's National Lampoon Christmas Vacation meets the pandemic because it's really, it's a comedy and yet it's a dramedy. And I know that at some point in our lives, hopefully we'll be able to look back on these moments and we'll say, wow, some crazy things happened. In the same way that people wrote comedies about world wars because they needed to put a different spin on what was happening. And so the Magnificent Quarantinos, um, I did talk to the producer of the Titanic about it and he said he wouldn't touch a pandemic movie with a 10 foot pole right now. So. I don't know, but somebody's going to want it. Um, and actually, he also gave me some great advice about another piece, so I will always, always forgive him. And I'm going to go back at that again later. And we're going to have that conversation again. So, um, so that that was written during this. And then I also wrote. Um, I'm in the middle of writing. Um, it's called a Mala Beads. It's a. It's a beautiful. I keep saying beautiful, but sometimes when I write, and I, it's it's it's. Um, mystical. I think things become downloaded through me because sometimes I look back and I write and I'm like, oh yeah, I put in something about that character. I feel like different people are having bits and pieces of their lives in my book without me, without my permission. So, uh, well, we'll talk about that for a minute. Ancillary characters. So I love ancillary characters and there's no unimportant character in a story. When you write, um, when you're writing a story that takes place about two people, some of the most interesting things that take place are the little snippet that you write about the woman that comes over to do their cleaning. You know, it might not, it might not be the major part of the story, but now you know why she feels angst at watching this play out. Or the, um, the little tiny piece about the man who's been taking care of their yard for all these years and suddenly like, so yard boss used to be Mrs. Muldor, and suddenly yard boss is Mr. Muldor. Now what happened? You know, so yard boss, I, I don't know if you, do you know about yard boss? Yard boss is that every landscaper knows who the yard boss is. And they might be talking to the husband, but they know the yard boss is the wife. Or they might be talking to the wife, but they know the yard boss is the husband. Um, and it's, because I'm such a huge research junkie, like I didn't just write a little tiny piece about this, um, Oh, what is it called? What's that round stone thing that people walk? Labyrinth. A labyrinth. Right. I didn't just, I researched the labyrinths and I researched what it would take to put it together. And I, because I, not just the authenticity, but I have to say that my biggest problem is that I find everything interesting. I find every job interesting. I'm a, I'm a story junkie. You know, if you tell me a little snippet of something, I can think about how that could turn into this amazing story. So while I was researching the life of a landscaper, what does that look like? You know, it, they, it, they literally a couple of times, they'd call it different things, but Job Boss was the title that I settled with because yeah, Job Boss, who is, you know, you, if the husband tells you, you need to pull up that tree, but you know the wife's the Job Boss, you're gonna not find time to do that. You're gonna find time to wait until you run into her to make sure, should I really be pulling up that tree? So uh, there's a lot of different aspects that are kind of um, interesting to me. So say the man has kind of, the, the gardener, and, and when I tell you he's a tiny piece, but say there's a little part of him who's been living slightly vicariously through this couple because Danny is his age and his beautiful wife 20 years younger is amazing. And the gardener thinks to himself, this, you know, this is kind of like a win for the team. Like somebody in my age category has this really nice life and this really beautiful wife and it's a win for the team. And he knows they've been married 20 years and he knows that, that they have a strong relationship and, and um, you know, or, or the, the weird thing that you find out that she's so offended all the time when people think that she is his second wife, like she's the wife that stepped in after their lives were successful when she was the one that, she's his first wife, and she was the one that made their lives successful. So it's a little irritating when she's 
viewed as the trophy wife. And um, so, she, you know, anyway, so different things like that that are, to me, important pieces of who people are. Sometimes what they, what irritates them, tells you more about their life than what they do. You know, so if this is a trigger, or if that's a trigger, it tells you more about your life. Now, where was I going with that? Okay, so I was talking about ancillary characters. Suddenly I realized um, in this pandemic that I was writing this, I started out writing just a short story, and I realized that I was writing a series of short stories that were people that had miraculous events happen that were all connected by the strength of one mala prayer bead. I don't know if you know what mala beads are. There are 108 beads on it, and people, it, they're called japa. They're, they're, they're actually um, prayer beads that have been used since uh, before the time of Jesus. And uh, so if you were somebody that just had your mala beads, you might pull them out and when you're anxious, or you might pull them out when you have a prayer to say, and you might and your prayer doesn't have to be in Sanskrit. It doesn't have to be Om Madam Padme Om. It can be, um, I am happy, I am healthy, I am loved. So feeling anxious and you pull out your mala beads and for each bead you say, I am happy, I am healthy, I am loved. Well, picture a set of mala beads that somehow has this power to magically transform somebody's wish and and when I say their wish, I mean their wish that is for their highest and best good. And so when I wrote the first story and I realized, oh my gosh, now she's going to pass on these mala beads. And the next person is going to read the little scrolled up directions on how to do the mala beads. And the next person is going to have a trial in their life that needs resolving or, you know, whether it's, and I'm, you know, to give you just a few examples. One is a woman who's, uh, who has become an agoraphobic and all she wants to do is step out of her house. That's it. So her wishes aren't huge, but she's tried everything she can think of. Um, and, uh, and then somebody, you know, some well-meaning person who barely knows her passes this on and says, just do this. Like this is not, this isn't a joke and it worked for me and hopefully it'll work for you and you just have to, uh, just have to promise me you'll do it. And then suddenly something happens in her life that forces her out the door. And so it's not the way she wanted it to be. She wanted just to be able to say, oh, I'm, I'm at the door now, I'm out the door. But yet something stronger than her will to stay inside happens. Um, and uh, is it the perfect answer to her prayer? No, but it's an answer to her prayer. Um, so so anyway, that's the Maldives. That's what I'm working on now. and. Uh, the first, like, I have to do everything in volumes. The first volume is um, 54 stories, and the second volume is 54. So it's going to be 108 stories to represent 108 of the sacred beads on the mala beads. Um, anyway, so, so that's been keeping me busy during this pandemic. And in the meantime, books are selling, and Events like this are just um, so important to me and being able to see people's faces are so important to me. And I know that, um, uh, and I'm a masker, so when I take this mask off to stand at this podium, I feel like I'm already having a good day. <laughs> so the idea of being able to stand here and speak freely is just such a lovely thing. Zoom has been a lovely thing. Um, the uh, books in the world that I do the interviewing for all winter long, all the last year, we did Zoom interviews. It gave us the opportunity to be able to communicate with people um, all over the country, as opposed to just doing local people and hoping that they can get to the studio that we have in, in Dennis that we use. Um, and also the classes that we've been able to take. I mean, I've been trying to, in every possible way, look at the beautiful bright side of of a, of a terrible time in, in world history. Um, there's even a story in the Malavids about a woman who remembers her mother talking about the 1918 flu. And the reason that I wrote that, and I made that character Barbara, is my mother remembers her mother talking about the 1918 flu and how everyone in her, in their area of, um, they were in Pennsylvania in a small mining town, and 
Every family lost somebody except miraculously my grandmother's family who somehow survived it with, um, and her father didn't get sick and he took care of their, they had, I think a family of seven and he took care of everyone and nursed them all to health. So, so I was brought up on stories. I was brought up on miracles. I was brought up on the possibility of everything being a possibility. Um, you know, I, I, my dad was that kind of person. So there was always this sense that he kind of looks at my reading, even though he's been dead for 30 something years, you know, that maybe, maybe he sees a little part of himself in Fanny. Maybe he sees a little part of himself in other characters that I put in. Um, what was I, oh, I was going to look to see what time it is. Cause I could talk all day too. I don't know if you realize that. <laughs> and I, I love, um, I love stories. I love conversation. I love people getting together and having um, having plenty of time to really digress. Digressing is the most fun of every aspect. You know, you can tell the short story, or you can go off on every tangent and find out that there is a more important story behind the short story. Um, so I'm never one to say to make a long story short. I'm more often apt to say to make a long story a little longer. <laughs> Let's sit down and pour another cup of coffee. Um, is, there, is there anything that you have for questions? I feel like I, I throw so much information out there. Um, does anyone have any questions? Do you wanna talk a little bit about, about your writing process? Oh, sure. I would love to talk about my writing process. Um, actually, it's a topic I have talked about before because uh, my writing process was a big surprise to me. First, I thought writing was supposed to be, and I don't mean that it's not difficult, excuse me, <clears throat> difficult in some regards, but the joy of writing and having it flow is just so overpowering. So I thought writing was, you had to pick out your story, you had to plot it all out, you had to map where the climaxes are, you had to create the, the conflict, <clears throat> and some writers do that. And some writers, which are the writing, the writers that I call architects, where they will build a story and then fill it in. And it's a wonderful thing. And it's a wonderful thing if that's who you are. Um, I'm an intuitive writer, so I'm a gardener. I throw a seed out, I hope it grows. It could be a weed, it could be the most beautiful of flowers, but I'm throwing that seed out. All of my writing has started with a sentence. A sentence that then grew into a paragraph that then grew into a story um, especially with Baklava Biscotti and an Irishman because there is a back-and-forth timeline and I didn't write the story of their relationship and then the story of this pivotal moment in 19, 1992 and the backstory for Gregory Costa I literally wrote it as if the scenes were playing out in my head. Oh, now a story where they end up getting, uh, deciding to buy an ambulance company. Oh, now a story where Danny has a heart attack. Oh, now a story where, and so the, the stories came to me that way. And on the first read of it, so everyone has beta readers, or most people have beta readers. Um, they can call them their friends. <laughs> but I try to get beta readers who are not my friends because my friends are just, wonderfully supportive. I don't want supportive people. I want people who say, I don't know, I didn't understand what that said, and then I have to rewrite it. Because it makes it more, um, it, 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 it alleviates the pressure of finding those things out after you've published. So the first reader said, well, I find the story somewhat confusing. And so I said, well, I mean, of course I know the whole story. I didn't find any of it confusing. And so I sat back and I said, okay. And he said, you know, this is your story. And I said, yes. And he said, well, for every chapter, you could write the year and where it takes place, 1992, Mystic, Connecticut. And it puts the reader right where they have to be. And he said, I know your first two sentences sort of do that too, but we need hints and we don't want to have to keep up and we don't want to have to figure it out. And I was like, oh, I could have done that. And so, so then it became, oh, let me place all of the uh, chapter names in there and, and then let me see if it flows better. And then the next time somebody read it, they said, oh my gosh, this, you know. And so anyway, so with these beta readers, the only thing that happened is I did switch two 
chapters around where one chapter so you're letting out nuggets of information that kind of keep it sort of on the mystery level like you, you, you this story is unfolding so something that you hear about that happened in their past factors into why they're behaving this way in their future so you're letting these nuggets out as you need to but for me it was so organic that i wasn't like literally at the end of something when i write this other um storyline that's you know toward the end and then i was like oh my god that's why i wrote that piece about his mother locking herself in the bathroom when he was a young boy like and i didn't know that's why i wrote it and clearly it factored into the story later on so i'm very intuitive and i'll keep and so what i start out doing i write i write i write i write i write and then then i take a break and by a break i mean usually an overnight break sometime and i'll go to bed thinking about my character so i literally have a dream the next morning i wake up and either i race right to the computer and start writing or i race right to the computer and i read the last couple of paragraphs which put me right back into the story and then i continue writing um there is uh, and that's how my screenplays were too it wasn't like i graphed out this happened and then this happened and then this happened um, and so, and I mean, I hate to even my, my, my wonderful mentor, Jewel, Jewel Selbo, who I've taken a few screenwriting classes and I have both of her books and she is a story structure person. And so when she reads my scripts, they format to her story structure, but I didn't format them initially or outline them or whatever. So there's an organic sense that I always feel is being like somehow downloaded, like I don't want to believe that somewhere there is a woman who lived this. Mm -hmm. Somewhere there's a woman from Neomachi, Greece, who lived this story and who married somebody, you know, that was in the service and who came to America to live and that this is parts and pieces of her story. And I, I, I want to believe that there is, like I get chills when I say that right now, mm -hmm. that there is something deeper in the reason we're giving the stories that we're given to write um, and that if you don't look at it as a class or an exercise or a task or a job and you look at it as this joyful moment where information is exploding out of you and you just have to type it down like you just have to keep up oh my god they want to live here now i have to find out about this place Oh, this is what they want to do for a living well now i have to find out what that involves so i want to say that my my characters definitely become real to me but also um they keep me on my toes quite a bit um you know my big joke about <laughs> and it's a terrible joke but i did finally tell it in front of my oldest daughter um when this book came out which was november the first book november 2016 my daughter had had a baby in September of 2016 and it was her third and his name is Travis and he's like the light of everyone's life. He's just this joyful person that everything you say, he's like, that's the best day I ever had. You know, he's just this joyful person. So when I tell you how much we adore him, just to compensate for what I'm going to tell you what happened is somebody said to me, so how's your new baby? And I was like, oh, it's good. It's selling a lot. And I had just heard that it became a finalist in the International Book Award. And they were like, they were almost like, just, and then I was like, you're talking about Travis, aren't you? So, so sometimes my characters become really real to me and it doesn't make me a selfish human being. <laughs> or maybe it does. Um, but that, yeah, that their lives are super important and uh, their outcome is super important. And, and sometimes getting the thing you need is not a pretty package. And sometimes getting the thing you need is not wrapped up with a bow at the end where you say, yes, all my dreams came true. No, sometimes getting, finding your way to the happiest moment of your life is really difficult <laughs> and and it takes a lot of uh and sometimes other people get hurt in the process and i'm not i'm not an advocate for anybody that's getting hurt by anything but what i'm saying is i'm an advocate for knowing what your knowing what your dream is and knowing what the most important thing is to you and if you are what if your soulmate 
the person you love more than anybody in the world can't give you the thing that you want more than anything in the world. Like, how does that dynamic work out? And that's really what Baklava Sky and an Irishman was. And then the intimate story of it is really what an Irishman's son is. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there.